Hello and welcome to an exclusive hour-long programme with me, Alex Belfield, talking to a man I have known for so long, for so many years, and year in, year out, we talk about different projects, and now he's back with a brand new book. Christopher Biggins, how nice to see you again. Very nice to see you, Alex, so I'm really thrilled to be here. Um, yeah, a book. Uh, who'd have thought? Well, except that, who wouldn't? I'm 60 this year, this Christmas, and, you know, I had a great life, and I have a story to tell, and because, of course, coming out of the jungle, everybody wanted this book, and we had about eight publishers, and we chose John. Blake and I found it very cathartic I mean uh, I can remember everything that happened 50 years ago 40 years ago 30, 20, 15 10, 5 ask me what I did last week I have no idea <laughs> at all but that's an age thing I'm not you know but it was I really enjoyed doing it when you write a book like this, it's so open and so honest. There must be things that you didn't want to reveal. Did you worry about that? No, I didn't, because I felt that the reason I haven't done it before was that I really wanted to be honest about it, you know. And, of course, one worries about one's family. My mother and father are still alive, and you didn't want to hurt them or upset them. And, luckily, I don't think I have, but I wanted to be honest, because I don't see the point of writing something and, and not mentioning certain things which, you know, are, are very important. And I think it's quite good for the, the writer to get it off his chest too you know you sort of I, I've never had a problem you see I've always been myself I mean there were areas in my life where I had to be careful about my sexuality because you know you couldn't really be uh, an outrageous queen running around doing a TV series for children because you, you, you were put in the same class as paedophiles which really annoyed me because I, I just can't understand it but anyway there's things like that and so you had to be a bit more careful but uh, you know in my private life I never ever sort of hid behind anything you know, and I think that's important because I think people do and they find that they, well there was a necessity and then sort of AIDS came along and everybody thought that we everybody was gay was a killer you know uh, because so many people were dying from this terrible disease and still do sadly but you know it's uh, we've got through all that and now it's cool everything is good and as for you being Mr. Showbiz today, it's interesting over the years that I've talked to you, show business has changed so much and it seems to me there's a bit of a drought now. There aren't that many people who come on a show and give it 100% and have a big personality and do a great appearance. It seems like people are a bit bored of being showbiz and, and they're getting younger and fewer stories to tell. The whole thing's changed, hasn't it? It has and I think you're right. I don't think it's changed for the better. I mean, I think, you know, in the good old days, showbiz was for show business, you know, and now people are embarrassed by it. It. And you're right, they're so young, they don't have any stories to tell. But, you know, it, it and that's what makes, a, I think, a good interviewer and a good interviewee. People who enjoy, you have to enjoy the job that you're doing. And, you know, and from both sides, you know, and it's, it's very important. And if there's a story to be told, tell it and enjoy it and give it 100%. It's no good going in, you know, at a sort of level. And, you're, you know, we watch things. I wanted to bring back variety and they brought back this variety show on... Uh, ITV and it's so dull I mean you know it's got no and I wonder now whether variety can't be transported onto television perhaps it doesn't it doesn't work it certainly is not working from my point of view you know I've been going for 40 years before I went into the jungle and I was no different but of course what happened was that when I went into the jungle which I found I, and also I make no bones about it I went in there to get myself a pension and then to go on and win it and to come out and find the whole nation have been behind you was fantastic I mean moving the secret of all those shows is to go in there and be yourself now very few people can do that because even though they're in that environment and you know you, you do see the camera you see the lens we don't see the cameraman or anything because they're in a sort of uh, uh, cave type thing or you know they're, they're cleverly disguised uh, but you are they are there and you do see them but the only time you're aware of them is when someone sneezes and you go bless you and and, uh, and uh, but some people I think some people <laughs> really played to the camera. I know they did. I mean, you know, Janice Dickinson, who is a professional reality TV star, she was totally aware which way to place herself. I... I honestly didn't think of the camera once. The only time I thought ever about anything in there to do with the technical side was when I, I did the uh, dirty uh, Give Us a Clue uh, charades, you know, which uh, and you know was, which is hysterical, and everybody was laughing. And I th as I finished it, I thought, well, that won't go out on primetime television. But of course, to my amazement, it did. And I think possibly it could be one of the things that won it for me because it's such a good gag and it's, you know, irreverent and, and, and brilliant. But you you have to be yourself. If you start acting, you're done for. Um, and, of course, the biggest thing is the boredom. 
Mm. I mean, there is nothing to do, nothing to read, nothing to listen to, nothing to watch, nothing to... You know, it's, it's extraordinary. All you have is those other 11 people. And that's, of course, deliberate, because then you get conflict. Of course you do. I mean, they're not going to put 12 nice people in there who all get on well and have a lovely, jolly time. <laughs> <laughs> I get to interview all kinds of people. In that chair on Wednesday will be Jackie Collins, your old pal. Yes. What can I ask her? What would be the killer question? I think the killer question would be... It's very interesting because Jackie is a terrific girl. She really is. Um, I knew her when she was married to Oscar and uh, she was devoted to Oscar, a really, really nice man. And over the years, I've not seen her as much. But I would think... Uh, I would go for the angle of why does she dress like she does? Because that would be quite interesting because she does dress very, very sexily hmm. and very well. And I have a feeling that is probably the key to the sisters because Joan is exactly the same who I know much better. Uh, but Jackie is a bit more outrageous, a bit more sort of, uh, with her prince, uh, she sort of goes a bit further than uh, her sister does. <laughs> Joan, I always feel, is well, Joan's very couture and uh, goes to all the designers. I have a feeling that Jackie isn't, but Jackie likes there's a slight tartiness about Jackie, I think, which I <laughs> Of course, it's brilliant because of how she writes. Mm. But I think you know, if you're going on an aeroplane and you, you're you're now you're at the, the, the airport and you see a Jackie Collins book, you think, well, actually, I'm going to get that because you know I'm going to have a good old laugh, you know, for the three, four, twelve-hour flight you've got ahead of you. I was thrilled, by the way. Um, Barbara Windsor couldn't come to my book launch, but she rang me from the airport. She was going on holiday, and she said, "I've just seen your book in the airport, so I've just bought it." And then she uh, texted me to say how much she enjoyed it which, which I thought was thrilling it's lovely to see you know your book on a shelf and it, it is true you do go around moving them around putting them in a better, better <laughs> position <laughs> I deny anyone to deny that everybody but everyone's at it in Los, in Los Angeles according to Jackie <laughs> I wonder if she's at it it's interesting do you think I could ask her that I think you could actually I mean she and she'll answer because she's very honest and she's very upfront she may well I say she's very honest she might lie to you how about I say to her I was with Biggins <laughs> on Monday Yes. And he said to me, can I ask you, are you at it? Yeah, I do that. Absolutely do that. I'll text you then on Wednesday and let you know yeah, what you said. Yeah, what the reply was. Oh. <laughs> 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 Thank God we're you not can, live. You can bleep that out. <laughs> <laughs> it's great being you, I imagine, because you've been here so long. You're 400 years old yes. and you know everybody and everybody loves you and you're invited to anything you want to go to. You can't buy that kind of acceptance, can you? You can't. And I am very lucky. I mean, you know, every day I sort of almost I don't, but I almost pinch myself to say how lucky I am because you're right. I can. I can, you know, I can pick up the phone. I can go wherever I want. I can ask for a table. Uh, at restaurants and I you know I always get a table I don't have to wait three months uh, you know for like uh, some people do and uh, you know it, it, it is a great life and travelling is good and you know you can do deals if you're as outrageous as myself I learnt that from my father my father was a great dealer uh, there's a wonderful story in the book where my mother and I I think I must have been about eight years old were watching a, a Betty Davis movie Dark Victory and he came in and unplugged the television I said what's going on he said I've sold it don't worry you'll get a bigger and a better one tomorrow <laughs> and we did but isn't it the fact that we couldn't finish Dark Victory? <laughs> but I love a deal. I mean, I love getting a deal. You know, I think most people do, but most people are frightened of asking for it, you know, because they're afraid of rejection. That is something I'm not afraid of, rejection, funny mm. enough. I think if you have that and you don't mind someone saying, you know, if like you see, you meet somebody and say, would you, do you fancy a what's it? And they say, well, no, actually not. Well, that's fine. So you go to the next person who would have fancy a what's it. Let's start as you as a child. And there you are, this quiet little thing, this bundle of joy. But it was a, a birth that was peculiar, having read the book, because um, you were nearly got rid of, weren't you? I was. I remember the doctor said he won't make cold bones, you know, and how wrong I proved him. I mean, <laughs> I was a weedy child. I had terrible pneumonia. I was, uh, you know, it was, uh, I was born in Oldham, Royton, just outside Oldham, and uh, my home of my family, my father. And um, it was very cold, because it was December, and my mother hated it up there, so she wrapped me in cotton wool, and I'm 
I'm still allergic to cotton wool to this very day. I have a funny aversion to it. And we came down in the Pickford's lorry and uh, we set up in Salisbury, where I spent my formative years. Um, and it, I, I then, you know, obviously grew and grew and grew. I mean, I remember my grandmother in Swathling. I used to go and stay with her outside Southampton and uh, she would give me a freshly gorgeous mashed potato covered in Heinz tomato soup. Oh, it was delicious, but <laughs> the inches must have gone on then, you know, just thinking about it. I'm, I'm expanding a bit. Yeah, I don't think Dr. Atkins would like that with no, the carbs, I... would he? <laughs> <laughs> but it was God, it was delicious. <laughs> Real comfort food. And were you always um larger in the portions? Well, there was a period, I think, where I wasn't, you know, I was, you know, uh, I, some of the pictures I've seen, I was quite slim. Um, and uh, certainly, certainly early part of my career, too. And I, I don't know, I suppose I just put it on over the years because I, I'm an enjoyer of food. I love food. I love my alcohol. I love a red, glass of red wine with dinner, a glass of champagne before all of that. I'm funny if I've given it up at the moment because we had such a heavy summer. And I thought I've got to get myself into training for going off to Australia and pantomime and things. So I, I've given up and I actually I have to say I feel really good for having given it up and much better but you know I suddenly sitting down at dinner with friends you know you think oh god a glass of red wine would be so nice now because when you came out of the jungle if I remember rightly you, you were looking like Arnold Schwarzenegger I mean <laughs> you'd suddenly Alex. become a sex symbol hadn't you <laughs> well I know there was the beard and I'd lost two stone and uh, no it was it was fantastic it was great and uh, I really it, it was it was an interesting look and there's a great picture on the back of the book of uh, of me looking like that and it's I love it I love that picture interestingly enough though whether one of the as I was being driven back in a limousine from the jungle to the Versace hotel to do interview after interview after interview I uh, one of they said what would you like and I said well, I wouldn't mind one of those barbers coming to shave me which they arranged and I, I I got rid of it perhaps I got rid of it too soon but anyway I'll perhaps I'll go back one day but it was great though to get rid of it just you just felt clean because you're not quite sure what you had inside you <laughs> you know because it was it, you know when you're in the jungle uh, interestingly enough the first night that I slept in the jungle I was a little nervous about what might be crawling because you're totally in the open, you know. Even though I was in the treehouse, we were up absolutely in the open and things are crawling around and coming in and out all the time, as you can imagine. Like, I was went in on a... I was always going to be a surprise uh, guest on the show, but I went in to do the first live um, trial they had. So I, they walked me miles down hills, up hills, around. <laughs> then we got lost. We really did get lost. So we had to then find our way back. And you, so you were arrive and you're sweaty and you're exhausted and your mind's thinking what's going to happen what are the things they're going to make me do and I'm sitting behind a bush and suddenly I hear the awful American twang of Janice Dickinson who is in a foul <laughs> mood and effing and blinding all the way down the hill and I think my god who is this one I, I, Neil had my partner had told me there was this extraordinary American woman so I guess this was her and so when I went in live on television that morning uh, or that night uh, for the people back home I I was, you know, I didn't know what was going to I saw Ant and Deck, which were great because they're old friends. And there was this Janice Dickinson who was seemed very nice. I and mean, she hugged me and it was lovely. And then we did the uh, the trials and she didn't do anything. You know, if it hadn't been for me, we wouldn't have eaten that <laughs> night. And, you know, and I did things that I thought all the things I did, I would never have thought I could possibly do. But I did them and I did them because I thought I'm here. I might as well do it. We're back on your favourite local radio station with Christopher Biggins today. Were you you then a shrinking violet as a child when did this happen well i i don't <laughs> when did this here by the way listen he's pointing to me did a rather grand gesture <laughs> with both hands enveloping me uh i wanted to say i want you to know that uh no well um i suppose it happened um i was always very gregarious i suppose i love school i mean i really enjoyed it and, and my great auntie vi who insisted i have a locution lesson because all my family taught like that because they come from wiltshire uh so i had mrs christian and this woman, Mrs. Christian, who was my elocution teacher, was mad on theatre and she must have seen something in me and she encouraged it and uh, I had a music teacher too called Mr. Lewis who looking back on it must have been um, quite camp in fact, very camp <laughs> 
outrageous and uh, uh, we just gossiped in my music lesson so all I can to this day play on the piano very badly is Daffodil Dell uh, but, <laughs> how appropriate exactly but I did <laughs> but I did uh, play uh, the Pirate King in the Pirates of Penzance and I played Katisha who's the woman in the Mikado and then at the age I think about 11 or 12 I did play the Ethel Merman role in Call Me Madam and that's how campy was <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's where I must have got it, I think. You know, I was wearing dresses at the age of 12. Uh, and it was, it was fantastic, though. It was great. So I had a great upbringing. And, of course, the other thing I had, and this is the irony which I find quite interesting, having been born in Oldham, which had a fantastic repertory company. So I, that's how I got started in theatre. And it was a... a and, you know, the, these things can't happen today. I mean, no one can do that sort of training anymore because I was on two pounds a week as a student ASM, assistant stage manager. And then I went on the following year to be a full ASM, eight pounds a week. And then uh, a stage manager, 12 pounds a week, my last six weeks in the, in the company. But I was heavily, obviously, supported by my family and they were wonderful to me and then on to drama school where they also supported me and then when I left drama school my my uh, father said to me well that enough's enough you know now you get a proper job you know you get 100 pounds a week and have your own house and all that but I didn't want any of that you talk in the book about Auntie Vi having mentioned her there she was quite a snob wasn't she really a huge snob I mean absolutely they had a wonderful seed shop uh, called Gulliver's in Faversham which is still there beautiful beautiful old building but you know it was wonderful I mean she used to going to stay with her and she would run me a bus she had no children so my, her, my mother was like her adopted child and then I came along and she would run the bath for me and bring in a glass of ginger wine for me you know and I thought oh my god this is it she told me how to make a Victoria sponge and how to lay a table the signs were there weren't the, they the, Christopher <laughs> the Victoria sponge signs were there you're right and then you went on as you say to play parts like Ethel Merman did you have the little thing on your face and did you kind of have that kind of speech thing how did you do what's your impression like. I think I, I, you know, there's a wonderful number in, those, in the song, you know, I, and I was a great fan of either that age of Ethel Merman. And so there's a number called Money, 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 Can You Use Any Money Today? <laughs> money, and you know, I, so I, I had that sort of, there was that really broad American woman uh, sort of, and I, funny enough, I know those sort of women now, but at that particular time, there weren't many women like that in Salisbury. <laughs> <laughs> You're kind of the British <laughs> Ethel Merman, don't you now? I, you now. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine you doing that. Um, so then show business was in your blood. Was it at this point that you realised that you weren't going to go the serious way? Because what I noticed in this book is you tended to laugh too loud and too much, and that got on people's nerves who were taking it far more seriously than you were. Nat Brenner, who was the uh, principal, was the most brilliant man, and he saw the quality. He was a very serious Shakespeare uh, man of the theatre, but he saw another other quality in me, which he absolutely encouraged. I mean, they, he had a flat above the Bristol Vic Theatre School and his wife, Joan, was there. And Joan, I would go up all the time and have coffee with Joan and gossip. <laughs> and, you know, I learned so much. And he would then come up and join at the end of the day. And we would then, you know, he would invite the odd pers person. That we had the most fantastic social time. And we, it was wonderful. And I, I did learn a lot about that. But I think what was great about Nat, he saw the qualities that people had. Like, for instance, as Jeremy Irons was quite frankly a bit of a joke at drama school but Nat saw something in Jeremy and he absolutely adored him and he you know he gave him opportunities and of course um, you know Jeremy went on to win Oscars I mean you know fantastic and I went on to entertain and I, and I think Nat liked that he also loved the fact that Tim Pickett Smith was going to be a great actor and uh, his best friend in fact um, Nat's best friend was uh, Peter O'Toole which of course is, he's a sensational actor uh, and so he he knew, but he knew all different sides. He was the most extraordinary man, and I look back on it. And he was very, very much an important involvement in all our careers, in all the different ways that we had careers. Um, it's interesting how you then went on to do TV and things like Porridge, and you were acting, uh, but you were an acting personality. I remember once having a conversation with a boss, and he said, we here do informative speech. I said, well, I do entertaining speech. Because <laughs> I would never be arrogant enough to think that I could inform anybody. And you're a bit like that, yeah, aren't you, absolutely. really? absolutely. I mean, for instance, uh, method acting is a total anathema to me. I just don't understand it. I mean, you know, when I did a, a TV series for, Amer for America called Masada, which uh, was about Mount Masada in Israel, all the uh, Jews were played by Americans and all the Romans were played by English people. Brilliant. And so Peter Strauss, who was a very good actor, uh, was head of the Jews, and he went up and he lived there for a week. Well, 
I mean, what could he have got? I mean, you get the feeling that something terrible had happened within 10 minutes. It's not for me. It's not, I don't, you know, I think it's a waste of time. Just learn the lines and off left. And you've had some tremendous roles. I was thinking about of all the different times we've spoken over the years. And I remember one of our greatest interviews was for a very, very classy part you did uh, in the Joseph uh, video, <laughs> which was the Master Baker. <laughs> The master bait. I remember that so vividly talking to you. And there you were with Donny Osmond, yes. with your crusty cobs, <laughs> looking delightful. Uh, You've I, had all the best roles. I you? have, and it was wonderful to do that. And it, he was so nice. And we used to get in at six o'clock in the morning to do makeup and everything. And he had to have his whole body uh, paid. So he would come in uh, in a dressing gown and he would take it off and he'd had a skimpy pair of uh, underwear on. And then they'd paint his body. And I, I remember the first day I met him I said are those, are those your own legs <laughs> and he laughed so much we were friends from then on I mean he was he was great and it was a lovely great thing to be involved in I must say I mean it was such fun and uh, no I have done I've done the most amazing when I look back I think my goodness the things I've done you know it's, and hopefully the things I will do where did you get your first break when did you become the biggins we know today well, I suppose, really, I mean, I always think that the pe the public were aware of me when I did Porridge. And, you know, I used to get people shout lukewarm and everything and all that sort of thing. It was on Safari, <coughs> which made me a personality, uh, which was a children's TV show I, get, I did, Safari So Goody, um, and which I loved with Gillian Tailforth. And then, uh, then I, by then I started to do pantomime. And I remember a producer from ITV, London Weekend, in fact, came to see me in the pantomime and said, look, we're thinking of doing a show. We, no, we're, we're going to do a show. Uh, with Scylla Black and we'd like you to co-present it and I, I can see myself now in this um, uh, terrible Indian restaurant in Birmingham sitting opposite this man <laughs> and, and he, had he said we'd like you to co-present a TV show on Saturday and Sunday nights with, with Scylla Black Scylla Black who I'd been brought up with I mean she was a star I thought no no he, could, he must have said something else he must have said uh, still a Turperwinkle or something you know I mean it was it was just it wasn't it wasn't possible and, and there I did it and I, I you know and it was fantastic and that's when I suppose that people really began to know me as a person you know and, and, and in fact I, I you know I say you have to be yourself and I think possibly in those days I wasn't a hundred percent myself because it was such an extraordinary thing to be appearing you know once a week and people sitting was with the great Silla black i mean and what a lifestyle that that was television when it was television i mean um you know we were on fantastic salaries she was on a lot more than i am but I, even my salary was great uh in the 80s and uh she had to have a new dress every week so i had to have a new suit and i had to have <laughs> new shoes and i had to have new shirts and one of the uh, great suits uh, tailors i had was tommy nutter uh the famous beatles uh, because i met him through scylla and he made me the most divine subtle now i mean subtle here Alex pink suit and it mm. was gorgeous really really gorgeous so you're, you're looking a bit sceptical there subtle pink and biggins yeah. don't really go together <laughs> do they let's be honest but it was a great suit I was lucky enough to go to Scylla's place uh, last year to do an hour special with her yeah. and I'd only ever seen before in the movies where you're in a huge great big building and you press the lift <laughs> and it opens in her front room I know isn't that chic I'm so pleased she got it because of course the, sadly Bobby died and you know her life was turned over and you know the house in the country is so big and you know she loves London life and it's wonderful for her to have that apartment which I think is brilliant and it opens into her drawing room it's wonderful you are the greatest dame in the business and I'm not joking I have seen you in various pantomimes over the last 10 or 15 years and you just steal the show you were born to do that and I don't see this as being second class or a bad actor I think it's having to be a great actor to have the discipline to turn up 27 times Times a week <laughs> is beyond belief. Well, I really take that as a great compliment for you, and I'm, I'm very thrilled you said that. I, and the interesting thing is that uh, 35 years ago, when I was first asked to do, I do pantomime, I was absolutely insulted because I was about 25, 26 years old, and every pantomime dame I'd seen had been 100. 
you know, at least 60, at least 50 years old. How could they ask a young boy like me to be a, you know, a dame? And I said, no. I said to Jamie Phillips and Dougie Squires and Peter Todd, no, I am not going to do it. They wanted me to go to Darlington to do Mother Goose. And uh, they persisted and they persisted and eventually they kept putting the money up. And I thought, well, I'd better do it because the money was fantastic. And of course, it changed my life. I mean, I absolutely love the genre of pantomime. I love playing the dame. I love, uh, I play the odd boy in, in pantomime, which was great, very different. And um, uh, this year, funny enough, I, I'm going to be in Southampton, the Mayflower Theatre. And uh, you'll understand because you're sitting very close to me now, Alex. And you would realise why I could never play an ugly sister because I'm far too pretty, far mm. too beautiful. Mm, I so, agree. Definitely. So I'm playing mm. buttons and uh, I'm really looking for, I do put a, I do put a dress on uh, once in, in the show. So do you, fans won't be disappointed. <laughs> I can assure you. But, you know, it is the most fantastic entertainment. And I go on and on and on, rather boringly, I, I think, sometimes. But I sort of want to reassure people that, you know, it's terribly important. And I say that in as much as for the, it's the first time that an audience have ever come into the theatre, not just children, grown-ups as well. I mean, can you believe when I was in the jungle, Jay um, Brown from uh, Five and Gemma Atkinson had never been to the theatre. So when I came, we came out, I took them to the theatre. And Gemma said to me, oh, when the curtain went up, she said, oh, they're so close. And it's fascinating, but there are so many people. Now, if we do a good job, and I know we do a good job, i.e. pantomime involving me. And what you do is kind of special because you don't play a guy playing a woman, you actually play a woman. It's a funny thing, isn't it, the dame? Yeah, it is a very funny thing. I mean, I I think that, uh, you know, I don't like, uh, with the exception of one, uh, one person I know, I don't like drag queens playing days because I think it's wrong. I think it's, it's a wrong perspective on it. I think you can get away with it as ugly sisters. I mean, we're very lucky this year. We've got Matthew Kelly and his son because they're the ugliest people I know. <laughs> Uh, playing the ugly sisters, <laughs> and no, and, and Matthew is a brilliant actor, and his son is too. So I think we're going to have a great. But you know, it it, it is. I I like to wear a different costume every entrance because it is, you know, it you want to get a laugh immediately when you come. And of course, being big, I I wear costumes so well, um, and. Costumes are very freaky, though. I won't have them in the dressing room. I have to have a room, uh, a sort of quick change room on stage where the costumes are set. And what happens is that the dresser will bring my costume in uh, on the first uh, for the first entrance. And then I'll never see another costume in my dressing room. I always do it from the wings because I'm never off. And it's very important that because I, I find them weird. You know, li uh, lines and lines of these highly colored, outrageous <laughs> costumes glaring at me and it's almost like I feel they're all going to take a life of their own you know and suddenly <laughs> when I'm lying down having a rest come and su smother me or something <laughs> you know so I have a great, great thing about it I keep them out as much as possible you mentioned a couple of times in the show that you wanted to do things and you said no and then they offered you more money <laughs> how do you do that because whenever I say no I don't want it they always say okay then and then they walk away <laughs> well they, they have walked away occasionally in my career but I think you know I'm lucky enough to be uh, quite unique. I don't think there are many Bigginses around. I <laughs> no, think. definitely. I, I agree with I, I that. I think it's one thing. And I think, you know, I've just been lucky in the things that I... But there, there are times when they say, no, I'm sorry, you know, that's it, you can go. Congratulations on being you and congratulations on the new book, Just Biggins. It's great. And I'll tell you what I always do, and I'll be honest with you, I always flick to the pictures first and yes. then read it afterwards. And seeing you there with Margaret Thatcher and some of the <laughs> remarkable people you've met, um, it really makes you, A, realise how long you've been around and doing it, and B... It doesn't matter what people think because you're still there. And yes, you'll have peaks where you're on I'm a Celebrity and you'll have troughs when you're not in the papers, but you're still there. And year on year, whether it be through Chitty or the Joseph video, you're doing stuff. And that's such a great place to be because there's so many people sat at home looking at the wall, aren't there? There are. And, you know, I, I do, you know, as I said earlier, I do pinch myself because I am very lucky, you know, and I've, I've done wonderful things. And there's, you know, it, it, hopefully it will continue, but you 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 never know in our business and the sad thing is that there are a lot of people at home looking at the wallpaper and who are brilliant 
you know, are absolutely brilliant. I mean, I went uh, yesterday afternoon to see Ivanov, uh, this new Chekhov play um, directed by Michael Grandage, and it was fantastic. There were 20 actors on that stage. Absolutely brilliant. And I know that they're all on £600 a week. Uh, but, it, you know, that's what it... You know, if it takes that to put on a company play with 20 actors, then that is brilliant and is very, very important. But... For those 20 actors, there are 220 at home, as good as them that were on that stage yesterday, and will, won't work as much, which is very sad. Christopher Biggins, you're a big star, and it's always nice to talk to you. Thank you for coming back on again. Just Biggins is in your stores now, and uh, I'll see you soon. Alex, thank you so much.